they come over my roof every night, so you can hear. You know, they're quite. You know, they're quite loud. They come crashing along the the roof, bound over the roof or down the carport roof and into the the trees. I'm I'm quite happy about that. Welcome back to the episode of the Wildlife Podcast. We've got one co-host right here, Billy Brown. And Tony Crowsdale. And guest co-host, Christian Hunnold. And this is what, your third or fourth time with us? No, my third, probably. We're having him back as a, this is kind of a repeat, or a second part episode, which might split up into two parts of a second part episode on rac- things like raccoons is like the most concise way I thought about to put it <laughs> what mess uh, omnivorous mesofauna that might be in your attic um, that's another way to think of it um, whether your attic is in Melbourne Singapore Philadelphia or North Dakota that's the idea why don't we start with some comments well why are you why are you doing that I'll give you a, um, I thought this was cool I I was talking to Bill Thompson, he's the um, guy who runs Bird Watchers Digest, right? Which is like the birding magazine for America, if not the world. And uh, he does a podcast. Uh, he does a couple, of, and he does this birding life. And so <clears throat> he's he's doing this birding expo thing in Philly, like kind of like the British Bird Fair. They did it in, in Ohio where he's from, but now they're moving to Philly for the next two years. And so I'm going to host them, like a meeting about it at the my environmental center. So I was talking to him on the phone, and he... I get a, you know, I hear his voice. He's like, you know, Bill Thompson. I was like, well, I know that voice anywhere because I listen to your podcast. And he's like, oh, well, I listen to yours. So that was kind of cool. The, the, hey! um, to, uh, you know, our first, like, cro- podcast, like, crossover, like, recognition. I think, I mean, we've done a crossover podcast, but it's not like the um, in defense of plants are listening to us that we know about before. Or were they? But um, if they are. Yeah, we, we we're a big fan of the podcast. Um, also, field notes we've been really enjoying. Um, we also enjoy Field Notes podcast, Silly Plays on Words, because they think like we do. Yeah. Like, what was the Pokeweed episode called? Pokeweed Every Day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and they had, a, they had a funny episode on the subnivian layer, the subnivian zone, which is what happens underneath the snow in the winter, mm. and all the life that is underneath the snow. It's the subnivian zone, a winter underland. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so so we had a good comment from someone named Eric Umildad who said, Yo, bro, I really enjoyed the May 2nd episode. Great stuff and content. Awesome. We got a message from Jim Greenway that said, Hey, when is there going to be an exotic invasives and synanthropic organisms ringtone or text tone? Wow. I hadn't even thought about that. But now we can do it. Yeah. We can All right. I was thinking about shirts the other day, too. About what? Shirts. Shirts, too. Because we were up on the top of the... I was up the City Hall band, and... Well, no, I wasn't banning. I was just... Were you the broom guy? No. Um, this, there was a... Um, Teresa in the Academy of Natural Sciences was there because they're getting um, ectoparasites. So Teresa was... They're collecting the ectoparasites? Yeah. It's, it's I Teresa, know Mark dusts them for ectoparasites. Yeah, but Teresa actually studies the ectoparasites and, like, does ectoparasites, you know, oh, say yeah. taxonomy. So, um, Teresa was there to get them, so that... Have you seen their ectoparasites? I have not, no. They're freaky-looking things. Like, yeah, uh, hippobosses, these, these <laughs> flat flies, and... So, Teresa was there to get those, so it was an extra hand, and then, like, I think uh, one of the... Game Commission higher ups was there, so there was a lot of Game Commission people. So uh, there wasn't really need for me to be uh, up there. So what I think next year, what I might do is, uh, if Art knows he's going to be well staffed, I might actually set up down below at La Colombe across the street because that's the best vantage point. You can watch it from the outside, and because that's the one day you know you're going to get a lot of Falcon action. Right. They flip out every right. other day. Right. Like right. you might see, you might not. So right. I think that'd be really cool. I mean, granted, it's usually on a weekday, but yeah, no. you know, people can just come to work late or whatever. You know, right, right. how many you know, nestlings are there this year? Three. Okay, two males and a female, and one egg did not hatch. Right. Okay. So we got some good video up on Facebook, and you tweeted out also. I'm not. I don't. I don't think so. I, I will do that. Well, well, we have. We'll have by the time you listen to this, we'll have great video both tweeted out and on Facebook of Tony 
looking out over City Hall while angry female peregrine, not angry, well, I think it was a female, but angry. You know, I have to look at the bands to tell. It feels like it was the female, but I'm not sure. Angry parent peregrines tell Tony what they think of grabbing their babies out from the nest mm-hmm. box and manipulating them for a while. People were alarmed about the broom. They're like, what's the broom for? And I'm like, we're not swatting them with the broom. It's just, they're going to go after the broom over your head because... You know. This was one. This is one of my proudest moments in in have when you, I was. Have you done this? Yes, I was the broom guy. Okay. It was, All right. It, yeah. Thanks. All yeah. Right. Was it good? It was fabulous, yeah. Christian. You're getting yes. impatient, aren't you? No, no, no. no. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Good. I got to be the broom guy, and I remember asking Art, "Do you want me to swing it or just block him?" He's like, "Just block him. <laughs> like, don't swing it." <laughs> you did it on a bridge, right? I did what? Were you on a bridge? It was the city hall. hall. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. Like, like four years ago. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it was a lot of fun. Um, Have you, does anybody band or do anything with the red tail nests? No? No. Red tails are just so ubiquitous. It's yeah, I think so. There's, there's no, no at least concern. Nobody's concerned about yeah. the species. So it, how do you keep track of which ones are which? Just you get look, used to looking at them and you're like, oh, that's yeah. T1, that's T3. That's, but, okay. Well, I mean, the adults are easy, but, you know, you get to know them as sort of individual birds. But, uh, you know, the fledglings initially all look alike and then their personalities gradually emerge and they look a little bit different. Okay. So. Yeah. That's a, you know what, we should do that as a bird Philly trip one day, is uh, walk from one to the other, right? Walk, oh, right, yeah. Walk from City Hall to... No, that'd be good. Yeah. Oh, and that'd be, you know, I think they have at least one fledgling that taken over, maybe two. Yeah. Maybe like, oh, yeah. Because they're, you know, too small to... Yeah. Do they interact? No. Like, do peregrines, like, shoo away red tails? Yes. Or? Yeah, at the nest, they would. Yeah. Okay. I once saw... When I was a bike messenger, I might have mentioned this as, as a like a retroactive wildlife bling. Yeah. But um, when I was a bike messenger, I heard a peregrine calling, and I stopped and I looked up and I saw a red tail and I was like, "This doesn't make any sense." I was like, "I, I hear a peregrine, but there's a red tail." And then I see the peregrine dive bombing the red tail, and it was at the flying around the PSFS building, which I don't think get, is there anymore. Right? <laughs> they just signed that release. Get getting getting a little too close to the nest. Yeah. Right. Um, so the and I'll just refer everybody back to the Urban Raptors episode from last year, June sixteenth, when we talked um, a lot about raptors in general, including about the peregrines, and had some recordings of us up at last year's peregrine banding, maybe the year before, but a uh, past peregrine banding. Um, and we're currently drinking Walt Whit by Philadelphia Brewing Company, and. Um, the Walt Whitman Bridge has a prairie falcon nest. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How is so? This is. I think we're catching the end of the spring neotropical migra- migration. Yeah, it's a little. I feel like this year it's a little. Um, the migration got a little delayed. So is I everybody think, posting stuff. Still? Yeah, I think it just really opened up once the weather changed. Earlier. Yeah. Once it got hot. We, yeah. Cut, when, what's, Earlier this week, I think there was a yeah. day when like this, there was somebody flipped a switch. Like on I feel like May tenth is like maybe like around the tenth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth is kind of like the peak. Yeah. So we'd be like just on the on the right side of the curve yeah. there, you know. But but I've been going to the Heinz, you know, a bunch of times last week, and it was dead. Yeah. And then one, I, I want to say Monday, um, suddenly there were sort of birds everywhere, like least fly captures, yellow bellied fly captures, like things that you don't normally see um, very much. Suddenly, everywhere. I'm off uh, my game this year. You're what? I'm off my game this year. Well, how did you do with the Burlington County World Series? Of we, we did. We did the Burlington. We won the Burlington County. Okay. But then we we had a miserable showing in the World Series itself because we, we did. We took six hours out of the World Series. We great. We could count the birds at the same time, but we spent six hours in one location doing the Burlington thing. Uh, and then like within and Burlington I, County, you mean, or one spot? Our whole the, route, our whole <clears throat> we were. Competing. Burlington County goes like from Delaware Bay to the ocean. It's a big, it's a wide county. If you're picking Delaware, county, River, Delaware River to the to to yeah Delaware River to like Sorry, yeah. an, an estuary of the Moloka River. Yeah, or, or, yeah, but so it doesn't actually touch the bay proper, but it gets close. It's okay. there's but salt it's, marsh there. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. Um, but yeah, we, we we didn't even like place. I, I mean, but we also like started at five thirty instead of midnight. And like finished around like eight, you know. We we're just taking it really easy this year. I was at I was drinking tequila with my dad until one in the morning the night before because we went saw Dwight Yoakam, you know. And my mom was like kind of recovering from surgery, so she was up still when I got back. She's kind of thrown off, so it was, you know, took the opportunity to hang you. It was a low key, and okay. we had and my dad. It was cool to do the um, um, Burlington County thing because he 
they, my parents moved to Burlington County, right? Yeah. So they, they so that's why kind of my tie to Burlington County. My parents moved there from Philly when my dad retired, and um, and he works at Palmar Cove Nature Park. Okay. And um, and so the and they're the ones who host the Burlington County thing. So and and this year the World Series was on the same day. So I wanted to, um, I'm trying to, you know, kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. Just have a bunch of fun. <laughs> Uh, all right. What are you up to these days? Uh, I am pretty busy with teaching this quarter. Um, and what else? I'm writing writing a paper on stormwater infrastructure and urban wildlife. How the sort of long-term re-engineering of the city's surface, essentially sort of the city-wide greening project, sort of doubles as though you were sort of designing a city for wildlife in interesting ways. That's just, um, I just that's mentioned incredible. that at a, not your paper, but the same topic at a talk that I did oh. last week. Okay. Well, we can be co-authors. I was <laughs> no, I was talking about. So I did something. So the, this is the Biophilly people, Helen um, right. Van Vliet, who yeah. was on the episode uh, episode a few episodes ago on the podcast a few episodes ago. They had a Biophilly oh, right, conference. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I missed that. Which right. is, I think, targeted mostly at, at architects and design folks. Right. And so I was sort of, I feel like the odd man on the agenda, but I had like five minutes at the end, and uh, and I was talking about because with the Biophilly stuff, I worry that people can be like. Just very binary, like, oh, we have birds, great, right. you know, and then not think about biodiversity or sort of natural heritage of a place and that right. kind of thing. Right. So I was talking about like how what 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 are what are we missing, right. and then trying to push people in the biodiversity direction. Um, but one example I used was was streamside sal- or streambed salamanders that are more or less tolerant of, of impermeable watersheds. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, so you have two line salamanders, which are relatively tolerant, and then long tail salamanders, which are more sensitive to, to impermeabilization. I was saying how like the Green City Clean Waters program, if it does improve storm water runoff and improves um, stream pollution and then temperature swings, that kind of stuff, right. could benefit the more sensitive salamanders. Yeah, right. Yeah, my point is sort of to, to sit, I'm sort of wondering um, about the, I'm sort of thinking about the, the urban greening part of the stormwater yeah, project. As, and stuff. Yeah, and as a sort of, you know, the unintended consequence of that is going to be more wildlife habitat. Yeah. Right? Um, and connecting perhaps previously fragmented patches of habitat and making it possible for more species to colonize more areas of the city. Um <clears throat> So basically, the assumption is that this should sort of get you know even more wildlife into the city, and nobody really talks about it. Like wildlife is mentioned once or twice it's, in the, well, in the it's policy. Totally, it's totally secondary. To yeah, it's totally secondary. Yeah. Part of which may be sort of intentional, right? They don't want to get people upset about like even more raccoons, right? Um, <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> but there's sort of um, what, what triggered is, is this sort of, you know, what I think is a kind of a schizophrenic approach to this, right? The sort of animal um, control approach to urban wildlife says, um, you know, animals are a normal part of the city, but when you find one that's, you know, in your house or it's causing you trouble or you don't like it, well, you know, it gets removed. And then it's also sort of the, the idea is that you can always potentially somehow deter wildlife from coming near your property or, you know, you don't have to interact with it. And there's this sort of idea that, they really don't belong. You know, they're sort of tolerated in the city, but they're always potentially illegitimate and yeah. always potentially problematic. Yeah. And that's how sort of animal, that's the animal control framework, right? Yeah. And I'm sort of saying, well, here we are completely redesigning the city, uh, making it more attractive for lots of wildlife. So how do we get to a point where coexistence gets to be the dominant? You are totally the right guy to invite onto this episode, Christian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So... The uh, yeah, I, the, the the and I was I was thinking just on a small scale just now because we have a um, out front of my house we have a uh, a downspout container garden mm-hmm. in an old uh, not old we bought it old style um, uh, livestock tank right um, and we've got some uh, some swamp milkweed um, some white turtle head planted uh, and the stuff that's doing the best is the the the, the, the iris. I mean, a, it's a fun spot to observe. You I mean it's like micro wildlife, right, you know, right. like yeah. insects and no, stuff, but interesting insects. Um, and I just saw this 
Actually, no, we were going out for water ice after dinner. We saw an enormous bumblebee mimic hoverfly mm-hmm. just sort of chilling on one of the iris leaves. And it was like, it was on the micro scale, yeah. certainly. Right. But as you replace concrete right, with yeah, vegetation, yeah. Yeah, you, <laughs> bingo, you have certainly more, more insect habitat. Well, know? and then you have things that want to eat the insects, right? So, yeah, so yeah. You're, you're creating sort of a food chain. So we, we barely, as a you know, I work for the park system as an environmental educator, and obviously our priority is to be in the park as environmental educators. Right. But sometimes we do go off-site to, like, a rec center or something. Right. Um, well, you're doing that with Bird Philly, too, right? To right, come, yeah. Very sort of self-consciously taking people out of the parks into... My way of... Yeah, yeah my way of uh, going... I much I like doing Bird Philly as outreach much more than I do going to rec centers or whatnot. I like hosting the rec center kids at the center. Yeah. Um, I think it's better use of our time. Um, but occasionally we do go to a rec center or yeah. something. And um, yeah. if I wanted, one of the programs that the kids really respond to is, is insects. Right. And they, because you can catch them. You right. Can them. That's right. Yeah. They're really into it. And uh, Try catching so a couple places I've gone, there is absolutely no green space mm-hmm. around there's none of the, uh, the rec center whatsoever. Yeah. And so the, the place I took them to was the, was the nearest water department, green stormwater you know, infrastructure yeah. <laughs> spot. Yeah. And we took out the sweep nets and they got, you know, cucumber beetles and, and lady, lady, you know, ladybugs and bees, although I, I tell them not to, not to, put, I'll capture the bees for them, I'll, you know, but yeah, I mean, that's been what they, and, <laughs> how does that work? And so they, <laughs> You know, sometimes that's the, literally the only patch of green space is these, is these yep. you know, and, and there's life in them. You right. Know? No, so it's really cool. Yeah. Great. And there's like a, I feel like I've read articles more on the herpetological side. It's not urban focused as much, but looking at like how frogs colonize stormwater drainage, mm-hmm. um, soils and yeah, yeah, yeah. like nexus parking lots. Right, right, right. Thing. Yeah. Um, so it's a... Uh, yeah, yeah, toads breed in the swale at the Vermont Center. Wait, which in fact, like, you're in like, Yeah. Oh, okay. It was kind of crazy because it's like, there was a, I mean, there's yeah. tons of habitat for toads there. But, oh, yeah. So yeah. And those toads are pretty, it, this is funny because there's this guy who I know um, from an article I wrote about native plant gardening, which mm-hmm. is kind of connects, um, John Janik. He now started up a plant company, which I buy from, called Good Host Plants. But they did not pay us for that pitch. I just like them. So he's a house in Mount Airy, like just across the street from Carpenter's Woods, um, and has a, and for reference, these are twin houses with some backyard Mm -hmm. and some front yard, like not big by suburban standards, but big by Philadelphia standards. And the dude like has gone, he's gone like overboard in a great way, but overboard in a great way about native plants. Like every inch of his property that is not occupied at some point in the moment by car, the car does drive over it, is planted with native plants. He took his backyard and put in a little pool, um, like a you know, sort of landscaped pond, but within like two years there were green frogs and, and American toads and breed, is, breeding in his backyard. Is it true they'll hitchhike on the legs of ducks that the eggs will? I have heard this. I have I don't know much about it. It's one of these conventional wisdom things you hear. Yeah. But I don't know. So how goes the paper writing? Um, good. It's um, I think it's ready. I'm uh, presenting a, a draft at a conference in Tucson in June. Wow. This is the paper I was I looked at. I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. Looked at an earlier version of it. Are you going to be in Tucson? You're going to get some time out in the desert or up in the. Maybe. Yeah. I think I'm going to spend a two or three days sort of traveling around. We look forward on Flickr. Yep. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, your pictures are phenomenal. They're ridiculous. Yes. We should say that again. Um, we'll link to this stuff, of course, but you can spend... You can think you're just going to go check out Christian's Flickr account, and you'll spend like a day. <laughs> you should be doing work. Like, oh. your pictures. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> I mean, I, w- I would probably put you at the number of, of the people that I know who are... Uh, for, like, and I, and I have a lot of friends that do it, and they're right. very good, but I think you're probably like number one. I mean, my favorite things to photograph are sort of... So that, um, there you go. But they're hard to find, right? They're they're not. You love your foxes. They're not typically very cooperative. I'm striking out on fox stands this spring. Um, yeah, a gray fox is not turned completely. <clears throat> yeah. See, I get gray, gray fox pictures. I mean, if you if you find a den, it's easier, right? Yeah. I don't know if there are any. Are there any gray fox around here? I, Theoretically, we are yeah. trying to. I'm trying to find out. They're native, but they're. Yeah, I don't know. They were here before the red fox moved in. The other in thing the that's 1800s. the other thing that's happening in the I mean not so much 
right around here, but in some of the more peripheral areas around the city where there used to be a lot of fox, there are now a lot of coyotes, mm. and so there are not so many fox anymore. Um, and, and the funny thing is, neither, I'll say this again, because we were looking this up sort of to settle a, a, a debate that I hadn't thought of this before, but we were talking with Tony and Matt Haley about red foxes and their, where they're from, and they're, they're North American natives, but their range was north of here and yes. stopped in the Poconos right. up until the mid-1800s, yeah. um, and then they moved south. Right. And so here we have sort of an interplay between two species, neither of which is technically native, and the doors are opened by human... What's, oh, yeah, absolutely. Or, Even yeah. the coyotes and the fox. Yeah. 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 Which would be a good segue, actually. I might just take it. You know what else has spread outside of its nature, thanks to human landscape changes? The Virginia opossum. Oh, yes. really? Yes. Huh. Various types of possums live in, or occur, or whatever we want to say, in South America, yes. um, up through Central America and Mexico, originally along the Gulf Coast and then up into the northeast and mid-Atlantic, what is now the northeast, sorry, now the southeast and mid-Atlantic of the United States. Mm-hmm. And then as European American settlers and then Americans sort of turned the land into sort of European style agriculture Mm -hmm. or used European agriculture to transform the land, the possums spread their range west and north with that. And then they were intentionally, this is more intentional, they were introduced into California and Oregon as a food source by people who had migrated over from like the mid south um, or Oklahoma, I don't know, the mid south, but because I guess they're tasty, and they have also expanded their range. At least this, this I also not a link to this. We've, I sort of found like a, a internet published like book about possum, everything you ever want to know about opossums, and they talked about how they also have extended their range with sort of asphalt road surfaces. That one of the reasons you see them dead on the road a lot is because they feed on the road a lot. Because they go out there to eat the dead bugs or dead snakes or dead mice or dead birds, whatever else that we don't really... All the roadkill you don't see very well because you're going too fast. Right. Um, they're coming out at night sniffing around and, and chewing it off the pavement. Yeah. And so the expansion of asphalt road surfaces has been an expansion of sort of feeding habitat for them. I, I had reached out to Jeff Folks on a recommendation from someone on Twitter who's doing some... Australian possum research, more in, um, more in rural or, or wild areas. So she was doing a project where she was reintroducing possums to, um, to uh, wild areas, and then I asked about urban possums. I was like, I don't do it myself, but you should talk to this guy, Jeff Folks, who then we talked to um, and talked all about uh, the possums. It was a good introduction to possums in general. Um, of Australia, and particularly of South Australia. My name's Jeff Folks. I'm a wildlife ecologist. I've been working in sort of wildlife ecology and survey work for close to 30 years in South Australia, which is a, probably the, the driest state in, in Australia. In terms of its size, it's probably one and a half times the size of Texas, <laughs> if that has any relevance to to you, um, so it's a fairly good big, perspective mostly for American, yeah. Um, so I've been doing that sort of work in mainly South Australia and the Northern Territory over those years. So, and I studied brush-tailed possums uh, for my PhD in Central Australia. So in the McDonald Ranges, east and west of Alice Springs, and also west of Uluru Ayers Rock, which most people will probably be familiar with. And and currently I'm working for the Nature Conservation Society of South Australia. Well, a brush-tailed possum, uh, it used to occur across most of Australia and probably their decline started in the 1930s. And, and so across much, much of their range, particularly in arid Australia, they've become extinct. So now they are mainly in sort of southeastern Australia, up the, the east coast of Australia, Kangaroo Island, which is an island off South Australia, Tasmania, which is an island state of Australia. They're very common on the, both Kangaroo Island and Tasmania. And probably in the very southeast corner of Australia, they're quite common, but their range has declined. So in a lot of places, their stronghold is in urban areas, 
in terms of the size of the possum, they they range from about four and a half kilos down the bottom end of their range in Tasmania to about one and a half kilos in weight in the tropics. So you can see there's quite a, a range in their the weights. So and also in their colour as well. So like typically around Adelaide, they're like a a silvery grey colour, but up in the tropics they can be sort of a coppery colour and in Tasmania they can be almost black. Um, they've got a, a strongly brushy tail which is sort of partially prehensile if you like so they can sort of hang around on branches or use their tail to sort of provide a bit of support for them uh, when they're climbing around the trees. Do we know um, why they went in, into decline? It's a combination of factors so it's introduced predators, foxes, also the impact of rabbits. So rabbits were introduced to Australia, European rabbits were introduced, and they caused a lot of destruction to various habitats across across Australia, and they still do. And also uh, Aboriginal people used to do a lot of burning across the landscape and sort of creating a patch. And uh, when Europeans settled Australia, a lot of Aboriginal people were sort of moved off their traditional lands into missions and so a lot of the traditional burning practices stopped and so big fires burned across the landscape and that sort of changed the structure and the composition of the vegetation and and, and in doing that took out lots of food uh, resources but also you know killed a lot of animals um, in the process as well so you know across their range they used to live in uh, like termite mounds out in the, in the central deserts where it's basically spinifex grasslands. So, they, yeah, they used to live in that sort of country into the mainly the forests and woodlands of sort of southeastern and eastern Australia. Why do you think that they have persisted in urban areas? Uh, because there's lots of shelter. There's food in people's gardens all year round. So, you know, they can eat people's vegetable gardens and they can eat roses and you know a whole range of things plus there's nice warm shelter that they can get into um, and that's why they're considered unfavorably in the urban areas because they get in people's ceilings um, of their houses they're known for sort of urinating in the <laughs> in the ceilings and, and making lots of noise and <laughs> so which is, makes them very unpopular do they have any kind of special conservation status because of their more general decline they do actually in South Australia they're rated under the National Parks and Wildlife Act. They they don't have a national rating, but in South Australia and the Northern Territory, and I'm not sure about other states, but yeah, they certainly do have a level of protection in in some states, but not at a national level. Does that protection affect how, like, let's say homeowners are allowed to deal with them? The uh, possum catchers who come and, and remove possums from people's houses and, and move them out. But moving possums from where they get caught somewhere else actually ultimately leads to their, their death because they're very territorial animals. So if they get taken from your yard and put somewhere else, they basically, you know, they'll, they'll eventually die because of the, they get basically beaten up by other possums and, and starve to death or there isn't shelter for them. So so the, the best thing that people do is actually when they leave the, their shelter in the, the roof of a house at night, block up the hole um, so that they can't get back in there so that they can actually find shelter somewhere else that's local, um, you, you know, like in a, a tree hollow. And a lot of people put up nest boxes in their yard so they can actually set up residence outside in people's yards and people are quite happy about that in most instances. So it is a common problem. Have you ever had to deal with one in your house? No, but they <laughs> they come over my roof every night. So you can hear, you know, they're quite, you know, they're quite loud. They come crashing along the, the roof. Um, they come from the shed and they cross from the the shed along the power line to the roof of the house and they bound over the roof or down the carport roof and into the, the trees. I'm, I'm quite happy about that. You know, it's good to hear them. And you can hear them fighting at night um, or um, sort of defending their territories. Wait, what, what, vocal, is that, yeah. what does it sound like when they're fighting? Uh, they're sort of screeching at each other. Uh, yeah, so a lot of it's just warning calls and threats. But um, sometimes you come out in the yard at night and find you know patches of fur on the ground where they've been fighting up on the trees and they've stripped fur off each other. 
how is like a ringtail possum different from a brush tail possum? Oh, they're a lot smaller and they're more restricted in their range in terms of across Australia. They're sort of more around that eastern coastal fringe and they're in southwest Western Australia as well. They do get into people's houses, but not as much. They tend to make a, a nest up in a tree called a dray and they sort of pull branches together and make a, a nest up in a tree and, uh, and live in there. And they tend to eat eucalyptus, you know, uh, foliage rather than people's vegetables and things like that and flowers. So they, they tend to sort of eat native flora rather than yeah, other vegetables and, and fruit in people's gardens and they're much quieter you know they you, you see them getting around at, at night on on power lines and along fences and things like that um, but they're less noticeable in the urban environment do you know of or i guess are there australian cities that are that are sort of looking at the possums as like subjects of of sort of specific conservation programming you know, people tend to, you know, promote nest boxes you know, for shelter for animals. So, you know, people still like to have them around. You know, people are obviously concerned about the impact of urban activities on possums. So, you know, one of the common things that affects ringtails in particular is electrocution on power lines. So people sort of make an effort to, I suppose, try and keep them out of the off the power lines, it's when they reach, like they can get along power lines, it's when they reach from one to another, that's when they get <laughs> get killed. They also get taken by cats and fo- uh, cats and, and dogs in a domestic environment as well. In, in some places they put rope crossing bridges across roads, major roads, so that they can cross above the traffic rather than try and cross the road and get and run over by cars. You know, brush tails are commonly run over by cars, so there's People, uh, you know, aware of the issue, and uh, people try and make measures to prevent their, you know, death by electric- electrocution or being run over. So, um, I imagine the electrocution isn't very good for the power grid either. No, you know, the lights flick- flicker a bit, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but a lot of the time you don't you don't really know, and or you go for a walk and you sort of see because ringtails have got a prehensile tail. Sometimes you'll see them hanging dead from a power line by their tail, you know, that sort of thing, so. Synanthropic organism. And I'll point out, for Tony's benefit, he agrees, but he actually asserted himself that theirs look better than ours. Depends better than what you like. <laughs> First of all, we only have one. Right. And it's very, like, you know, thin, narrow-nosed, and like a, like a... It looks like a big rat. Yeah. And its hair always looks messy. But it's, it's, yeah. I think it has its, its charm. Especially when they're little. I think they're kind of cute. The, the yeah. little are adorable. Yeah. But their possums look like... Isn't there sort of a semi-famous uh, pet opossum in West Philly? Trash Cat? Have you met Trash Cat? Check on Facebook. I'll look it up. Yeah. yeah. My friend Heather Squire is obsessed with possums. What, in what way? I mean, in they're, a happy they're, way? Or they're, they're, a... they're actually... They, they make... I mean, you know, don't tell the game commission, I suppose. But they make, they make apparently semi-decent pets. They don't live very long. I think their lifespan is two years, maybe, tops. Well, the two years in the wild, apparently they can make it to, like, four. Oh, they can? I didn't know that. I thought they were sort of programmed to self-terminate around 24 months. It seems like it's a little long. They 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 don't live long. Right. Um, And there's an interesting sort of natural experiment to this effect where there's an island, I think off the coast of Carolina, I can double-check it, but that where there's a predator-free island that has possums. Okay. And has been so for like thousands of years. Oh, wow. And the possums there live twice as long as the mainland possums. Oh, okay. So there's some thinking that they're so easily eaten by yeah. other things that there's no evolutionary point in living long. Oh, yeah. right, okay. So hmm. you know, the predators all of a sudden, they, right, right. They, they, they could reproduce more if they happen to live longer. Right, right, right. Genetically, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. But they apparently they can be house trained pretty easily. Yeah. So if it gives up in a cat box and... I mean, I wouldn't, you know. <laughs> I already told the possum story, right? The you told the raccoon story when you were in jury duty. The the, the everybody got love somebody story. So in West Philly, my street, there was a possum laying in the street, and we're looking at it, and we're kind of like, is it really dead, or is it just playing possum? <laughs> and it was in the summer in Philly. How did it smell? 
there wasn't an odor yet. But Philly, you know, it's not. It's it's very hot and humid in the summers. Kind of like right now. Yeah. So not really like <laughs> the May. conditions <laughs> conducive to like preserving something <laughs> um, long. And these, these two gentlemen walk up, and the guy goes, "If it was a winter, I'd take it home. I'd burn the hair off it and I'd eat it." And my friend goes, "Man, that thing is too ugly to eat." And the guy just goes, "Everybody gotta love somebody," <laughs> and just like walks away. And it's kind of like this, like air of that being like some really sage wisdom or something. Yeah. But then we're kind of like, "Was it though? How old was the guy?" Probably the sixties. That's funny. It's something like I wonder about like the cultural knowledge of eating odd non-game species. You know, right? Like, yeah. You know, like. Apparently, they were tasty enough to introduce to new places like 100 years ago. Right. Or 150 years ago. And and now you say, if you said like, come over for dinner, we're serving possum. Yeah. And maybe your adventurous friends would be like, okay, we'll give it a shot. Right. But like, right. Yeah. most people, you're at the poli sci department in the drugstore, like, hey, we're serving possum no, 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 at the no, next staff would, meeting. That would be fly, no. <laughs> I mean, I think you could do a squirrel, right? Which is sort of a game animal mm. in some yeah. parts of the country. Yeah, very much Still so. today. Um, and I've tried it once. I can see why it's not served in restaurants. Um, I mean, it is edible, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's it's odd how what is you know what's edible in you know in some historical period turns into not edible. Yeah, raccoons are quite edible, apparently. I imagine they are. Yeah. yeah. So we also got a little bit about possums from. Rye, who who's a listener. This is my favorite thing. He had heard us like putting a call out for possum stories from Australia, and this is a guy in Perth who does sort of like nature walks and looks for critters. Now we're gonna hear Rye talk about possums in Perth. My name is Rye Beaver, and I'm an amateur naturalist based in Perth, Western Australia. Getting out mainly at night to look for wildlife and blogging on wildlifewatchingaustralia.wordpress.com. We have a couple of possum species, but the most common is the common brush-tailed possum, and we also have the endangered western ring-tailed possum, but its distribution is further south of Perth. Perth is located on the Swan Coastal Plain, a narrow strip between the Indian Ocean and the Darling Range, approximately 125 k's from north to south, extending about 40 k's inland from the Indian Ocean. With a population approaching 2 million people, it's quite a case of urban sprawl. I'm a keen user of the social media naturalist platform iNaturalist and was reviewing marsupial sightings in Perth and found a user that had seen a possum in Gosnells, which is about 12 k's from the CBD. I went a few weeks later to the same location in John Oakey Park, which is located on the banks of the Canning River. The source of the river is up in the hills to the east of Perth, where there are still fair chunks of bushland. Fringing vegetation has been left on both sides of the banks of the river, and I expect this is being used as a wildlife corridor. The first evening I went there I found approximately 20 brush-tailed possums by spotlighting and a fair few frogs as well. I think the possums are using the river to come from the, you know, in the east where there's larger parts of bush and then coming down into the CBD using the river. I'm working my way down the river to see how far the possums extend. I checked a few k's down and also found possums in Hester Park in Langford. I don't exactly know how far they will extend, but I'm enjoying finding out. I've been back to the original, back to the park four times now, and the most amount of possums I found were 25, and the least were five. I'm not sure if that relates to them moving seasonally, or just my ability to find them. In a visit during October, which is the Australian spring, I saw many with babies, which was really cute. I've, have, I've found a few other leads um, in other areas of Perth, where the possums are not living so much in remnant bush, but in amongst houses and some old surrounding trees. So that's my next place to check out. One interesting find that wasn't made by me was a dead chudich, which is a western quoll or a marsupial cat, next to a primary school in Bateman, which is fairly close to the centre of Perth. The chudich is one of the largest remaining native predators in Western Australia, and now they're pretty rare. It's not known how this one found its way to the school, but it's surmised it either made its way down the bush corridor I mentioned before, or perhaps it was someone's pet that escaped. They've, pretty, they've got pretty large home ranges, so it's not thought it could have been living in a bush area in the area. While Perth, like many cities, has had much of its vegetation cleared, for some areas of bush have been retained, and also wildlife is adapting to the urban environment. 
it's really encouraging to see the possums in the suburbs. We also have Quenda, southern brown bandicoot, in some surprising places, dolphins in the river, which is right next to our CBD, and kangaroos in suburbs where there are larger pieces of bush adjacent. We also have a surprising variety of herps and birds. The urban wildlife does have to compete with issues of continuing habitat loss, predation by introduced species such as cats and dogs, and also being hit by cars. I want to encourage people who listen to the podcast to record their wildlife sightings in the various citizen science tools that, are, that exist. I record my sightings in iNaturalist. If you're ever in Perth, touch base and perhaps we can go and find some interesting creatures. Hey podcast listeners, we asked Rye to expand a little bit on those quenda in surprising places. I have seen quenda in four different locations in Perth, but the most interesting location is in East Perth, less than two kilometres from the CBD. It's completely surrounded by townhouses and multi-storey offices. It's right next to an artificial cove lined with pubs, cafes and upmarket housing and the Quenda live in a little park with garden beds and grass lawns. They root around in the mulch of the garden beds filled with mostly native shrubs. The council have put up signs to educate people as they superficially look like a large rat but they're a proper marsupial. You can see the diggings as they leave little conical holes from the shape of their nose. The one we saw was in a garden bed that also had a large concrete pylon for a bridge across the cove. It was digging around and we saw it find a small grub and was pretty unconcerned about our presence. An amazing finding in such an urban location. I just was so tickled that we got somebody from Perth. Yep. I mean, you're academia, so you communicate with people all over the world all the time. But, like, you know, I don't often, like, connect with people in the like the other side of the planet in the most remote city I can think of. Right. Hey, podcast listeners. That's the end of part one of Cute Furry and In Your Roof. Please stay tuned for part two.